In our first story, pressure is mounting on government to release an investigative report on former Ghana Maritime Authority boss Kwame Usu following President Ekufuado's decision to appoint him as board chairman of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Some legal and governance analysts have questioned the latest appointment, especially in the wake of concerns that the Transport Ministry has not provided details of the investigation it conducted into allegations that Mr. Owusu has supervised the renovation of his uh, two-bedroom official residence at the cost of one million Ghana cities. Listen to him when the issue first came up. One million Ghana cities that has been used to renovate a two-bedroom house for the director general. Construction period pictures, show them. Yeah. Construction period pictures, the auditors were there day and night taking pictures of construction and then came out the building. And let me tell you, that building is now made out of four bedrooms of the main structure, the main house. A living room, a dining room, kitchen, a family room, a library, and a basement. An issue has been raised with regard to Director General having 11 air conditions. That I consider mediocrity. In a two-bedroom house. In a two-bedroom house. Where would I put them? The places that I listed to you each one of them to have an air condition will be 13. So the 11 is, is really not enough. Now, senior research fellow at the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, Dr. Kujia Asante, is charging government to rescind its decision to appoint the former maritime boss as the new board chairman of the Ghana Revenue Authority. He's been speaking to join news on the sidelines of an ongoing uh, of a governance program uh, which was held earlier today in Accra. Uh, there's a sense of impunity. Um, this is somebody who, I mean, from um, all the facts that were said, put himself in a conflict of interest. He probably didn't see anything wrong with it, but from the set of facts that were put across, there's no way he should have been doing what he was doing. And didn't even seem to appreciate the, that his conduct was unbecoming as a public servant. So, yes, that what has passed by the bridge, even the fact that, you know, the investigation really didn't lead anywhere and so on, was a problem. How do you then reward the person with a chairmanship of the Ghana Revenue Authority? The government is asking us to pay taxes, encouraging us. We are not doing well in terms of our tax to GDP ratio. What message do you send? to the people that you are encouraging, you know, to pay their taxes so you can develop uh, this country. When you put that person into that kind of role, it means that, you know, there's a real issue, there's a real problem. So for me, I think uh, government is something, a decision really, it, it does not help even the effort to expand the taskness in terms of all the Ministry of Finance is trying to do. It doesn't help, it conveys a very, you know, wrong impression that this is the kind of conduct, you know, that we accept. So I think it's a decision really that should be rescinded. Well, the Ghana Integrity Initiative has also issued a statement on this matter demanding the removal of uh, Mr. Owusu as board chairman of the GRA. And uh, the statement reads, uh, GII is calling on the president to revoke the appointment of Mr. Kwame Wusu following the intense public outcry in the pending investigations into allegations of abuse of office and conflict of interest involving Mr. Wusu. The appointment of the former managing director of the Ghana Maritime Authority as the chairman of the board of directors of the Ghana Revenue Authority has evoked disappointment among the general public, particularly because of the events preceding his exit from his previous job. The raging debate is focused on the integrity of Mr. Wusu and its implication to the public perception of the new institution he has been appointed to. It's important to remind the president of this section of his oath of office, quote, and that I dedicate myself to the service and well-being of the people of the Republic of Ghana and to do right to all manner of persons, end quote. 
The said service, which the president swore to all Ghanaians, including holding himself and appointees accountable to the people of Ghana and making information on his accountability available to the people whose mandate he holds to govern. Also, the president should be guided by Ghana's commitment to the Open Governance Partnership, which the government of Ghana signed on to in 2011. The OGP commitment revolves around the pillars of transparency, empowering citizens to participate and harness new technologies to promote good governance. Therefore, publishing reports of investigation into the conduct of public offices is an evidence of good and open governance practice which would be consistent with their oath of office. Efforts by governments over the years at widening the tax net has been fraught with many challenges. Anecdotal evidence suggests that in addition to the myriad of problems faced by the Ghana Revenue Authority, trust in government to use the tax revenue prudently for the benefit of the taxpayer sinks with every corruption exposed in the public sector. In line with the above, GII holds the view that it is out of place to appoint an individual whose integrity has been questioned to the board of such a sensitive entity as the GRA. However, if the president wants to stand by his decision, then GII calls on him to publish the report of investigations that contradict the allegation of conflict of interest and financial misappropriation made against his appointee. Failure by the president to revoke Mr. Kwame Ousu's appointment or publish the report that clears him will only contribute to negating all the efforts of GRA to promote voluntary compliance of the country's tax laws and hence leaving the country to mark time at tax to GDP ratio of 12.6%. Well, government remains tight-lipped on this matter as several calls by Joy News to the Transport Ministry for some reaction to these calls have gone uh, unanswered. We will continue to follow up on this uh, and as and when we get the authorities, we will bring you their response. Moving on, lawyers for key suspect held in uh, for the murder of the MPP Upper East Regional Chairman Adams Mahama say they will challenge the decision of an Accra High Court to rescind the bill granted Gregory Afoko by another High Court. They've described as shocking the decision of the court presided over by Justice Merle Wood. Ms. Afoko has been in the custody of the police since March 2015 and has still not been released despite being granted bail in March this year. State prosecutors today argued Gregory Afoko will not show up to stand trial if the court does not overturn uh, the bail granted earlier. There's more in the following report. The AG's office barely a month to the end of the Gregory Afoko trial discontinued the case following the arrest of a second accused person. His lawyers will push and get an Accra High Court to grant him bail in March 2019. But Gregory Afoko will remain in the custody of the police. Contempt proceedings commenced against the IGP and Director General of the CID for disobeying the court order. The court has set July 22 to rule on this matter. But even before that happens, the state prosecutors argued before another high court that releasing Gregory Afoko would jeopardize the trial. Chief State Attorney Marina Pierre of Paris said Gregory Afoko will not show up to stand trial. Mr. Afoko's lawyers urged the court to dismiss the application, insisting another high court had already ruled on the matter. Justice Mele Wood granted a request rescinding the bill granted in March 2019. Spokesperson for the Afoko family, Nana Yaose, finds the decision strange. I'm very surprised that a high court of court jurisdiction will rescind the bill granted to uh, Greg Afoko. When same has been appealed against, there's a pending appeal in respect of the bill granted to Greg So I'm wondering a jurisdiction with which she rescinded the decision. The trial of Gregory Afoko is meanwhile expected to commence on July 17, 2019. Now joining us to examine this issue further via Skype is uh, Justice Remsai. He is a lawyer and a lecturer at the Gimpa Law School. Many thanks for your time, uh, Mr. Remsai. Uh, uh, what do you make of this new development in the Gregory Afoko case? Is it actually possible for another high court to rescind the decision of another high court? Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to your guests. 
Uh, first of all, I think to even understand what uh, happened today, we need to go back to the basics. Uh, the basic in the sense that what is the reason for pre-trial detention? That is, why should we keep someone in custody while a trial is going on? There's only one reason why you should keep someone. That is to ensure that the person, you know, appears for trial. And the law has made it clear, and the Supreme Court recently pronounced on that, you know, fact that bail should never, I mean, bail should not be used as a way of punishment for for persons. So the overwhelming position of the law is that a person should be allowed freedom even when facing trial of whatever, you know, kind. Now, if we track back the process, somewhere in March, we recall that the High Court granted bail to, to, to the gentleman in question. Then the Attorney General, you know, to obtain a stay of execution of, of the bail order. That was refused. Then the Attorney General appealed against, you know, the, the bail in the Court of Appeals. So as we speak, there is a, an application for, I mean, an appeal pending to be heard. Uh, it is therefore surprising that the same, you know, Attorney General prosecutor who has appealed to a court of appeal today will, will make, will repeat his application in a, a lower court, which is also a, a court of coordinate jurisdiction with the earlier court that granted it. So uh, there is an anomaly there. Now, so, so, uh, so Justice Shemsai, if I understand you clearly, what you're saying is that. The Attorney General should have gone through the appeals court process. Is that what you're saying? Precisely. Precisely. The Attorney General, having filed an appeal against the, the, the bill, the grant of bill, right. uh, should have followed through the, the, the process. Now, the, the, so on, on the part of the Attorney General, there is a problem. Why would they make an application, and I understand an oral application for that matter, trying to circumvent an order that is given by a, a court of court jurisdiction? That is the first point. Now, the second point has to do with why the judge would uh, uh, grant it. Of course, there are reasons why a judge may, may, may commit a person to, to, may commit a person to cast. For example, if the condition of oil has changed significantly, for example, uh, if one of the things that we consider when granting bail is whether the person has a, a fixed place of abode. If the person had at the time of grant, getting the bill had a fixed place of abode and subsequently loses that place, it is possible that the bill you know, will be rescinded. But the question then is what has changed? And, and two, is the judge aware or has she been made aware that there is an appeal on the same subject matter that he, he was about to pronounce on? So these are questions that we can ask. So from the part of the attorney general, there seems to be an anomaly there why they will file an appeal and then come to a court step below mm. to, to, to make an application of the same, uh, you know, no, no merit. Then on the part of the bench, uh, the court, uh, if the court is aware that its sister court has given a, 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 a granted bill, why would it, uh, uh, and, and that there's an appeal pending, why would the judge grant uh, or rescind the decision? So... All along, you can see that both on the part of the bench and also on the part of the, 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 the prosecutor, attorney general, there seems to be an anomaly there. So um, these are all but, very but, key critical questions that, you know, the judiciary and the executive ought to answer. But, I mean, what options remain for, you know, um, the accused? Well, um, the, the, the accused has options. Um, I mean, they may pursue, I mean, the AG has, having filed an appeal, they may pursue it. Uh, there's also an option for them to uh, apply for, or, or, for uh, uh, what we call it, to also appeal against, you know, uh, this, uh, the, the new one that has been given. They, they may appeal. But at the core of all this, it's not even much about the processes because the processes take time. It is more about the liberty of the individual. And if you recall, this gentleman has been under custody for how many, almost three years now, facing trial. In fact, the trial almost ended when the attorney general entered a nolly prosecutor right. and intending to start the trial afresh. And, and and so when you put all this together and you realize that all this is being done against one individual, then you begin to see the enormity of the unfairness and the oppression that the system is putting on this particular case. 
I think it is time uh, our, 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 you know, the law office of the attorney general, I mean, began to have a reflection over this particular case. Right. Because the case is not giving us a, a proper image as a country, as a democracy, you know, going forward. How can an individual be, be treated this way for all, the, I mean, for whatever crime it may be? The question is not whether he has committed a crime or not. The question is whether his basic liberty, the right to freedom, a personal liberty, is and, being respected. That is the question now. Right. And, and I think glad, the AG should have a I'm glad you talked about his, uh, his uh, personal liberty because a lot has been said about the loud silence of a lot of groups, including the Ghana Bar Association, of which you're a member. So uh, should we be worried about this loud silence, particularly from your oh, perspective and your mother group? Uh, we, we, should be, we should be ashamed of ourselves as a, as a bar, you know, we should be very much ashamed of, of ourselves as an association which has had a great history of, of defending the liberties and the rights of simple individual. Right. To be silent on an event of this nature is something that I cannot even phantom. I cannot even begin to, to imagine. But yes, that is happening. And I, I, I pray that the bar at a point will start speaking on this particular issue because um, it, it is not something that should be should be made to look like it is it is normal. It is not a normal thing. And I think whenever uh, institutions, for example, the bar, should be speaking about it. And this is not the first time we have faced situations like this. Mm -hmm. And this is not the, 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 the last time. And the bar has been speaking about some of these. So one is wondering why this particular one has you know right. taken uh, them so long to to, to speak about right. even when people who have not done anything about law are ordinary people are, are surprised that this development in the right. bar is quiet and i think it's something that we should think about carefully as, as a bar certainly thank you so much justice srim sai is a lawyer and law lecturer at the at gimpa here in accra many thanks for your perspective on that issue <laughs>
is the existence of this health installation, the Lekma Hospital, on this very stretch. One would wonder what a drive or a ride to this hospital for a pregnant woman may be. Daniel Dazif, Joy News, Teshi. Well, earlier Monday, Municipal Chief Executive of the area, Ajile Chum Jamra, told Daniel Daze on the Super Morning Show, although the contract for the project has been awarded to another contractor, some work has begun. We have a very bad, uh, uh, we have a big portal at the first junction. So today they are coming to do that one. And some of the inner roads. They've started with the King Cortez Road to the Methodist going to school road at the moment. You mentioned twice in our conversation that this road is beyond the assembly, but then you mentioned again that it's an urban roads project. Yes. But isn't urban roads decentralized to the assemblies so that you are going with the road engineer who works I'm at head urban office. roads? Uh, urban roads at head office. They yeah. have reassigned the contract. Urban Roads has reassigned the contract, but yes. your road engineer will be supervising that. The road engineer you work with. Yes, yes. So how is it beyond you? Well, until they do the work, then we, we can do the supervision. But when there's no work done, well, uh, that is the reason why I told you today we are going there. So we've been checking with her for the latest. She says she met with the Roads and Highways Minister on Monday, and soon there is going to be a solution to the issue of the poor roads. We'll be following closely to ensure uh, the Lekma roads are fixed. We made efforts to speak to the Roads and Highways Ministry on this, but none of the ministers or officials have been available to speak to us. But you can be sure we will keep our eyes on this. In other news, two people who died in violent clashes over a parcel of land at Dagomba Line in Kumase have been laid to rest on Monday after a short Islamic ritual. 25-year-old refrigerator mechanic Zuberu Zakaria and 20-year-old scrap dealer Abdul Mumin Harun were buried under high security alert. They were among casualties in two days confrontation in a dispute between uh, scrap dealers and another group over the ownership of the land occupied by squatters. 120 people were arrested in connection with the incident and they've been remanded into prison, prison custody uh, by the Asakore Mampong Magistrate Court. Ohim Interior reports. The Municipal Security Committee is taking steps to avert escalation of the violence. Chief Executive Ali Duseidu says the feudal factions have committed to peaceful means to resolve the impasse following a series of meetings. He dismisses reports of the clashes having ethnic undertones. Uh, it was so fruitful. Um, we resolved to have four persons from each faction to go to either faction, to go and explain to them, to, symbol, to, to give them a symbol of unity, a symbol of uh, preparedness to uh, make sure we get peace within the community. And uh, that's what they did. They went to both factions, they spoke to them. Currently, as I'm speaking with you, the situation is relatively calm. Um, as we see, uh, it wouldn't degenerate because uh, the sort of remorsefulness that has been exhibited, and we feel it down there. Uh, we are hoping and praying that it wouldn't escalate uh, to this might be the end of it. Because there are issues that we need to talk about, there are issues that we need to tackle, one after the other. First thing first. Now the first thing is to make sure that we get the dead bodies buried, then we look at the next line of action. What do we need to do to make sure that we, get, we bring finality to the issue? It's about land matter. It's purely land matter. It has nothing to do with Zongo Dagomba faction. Dagomba community says it will collaborate with security agencies to quell any attacks involving its members. Fuseni Abubaka helps the community in the Ashanti region. We hear some commentary we are unhappy about. There are suggestions that Gombes are fighting Zongo people. It's never true. We are all Zongo people. The leaders of the other faction are always in the company of the Imam 
the Dagomba community all the time. If the youth had prompted the Imam or his deputy, this wouldn't have happened. Somehow, he did not know this could have been avoided. Nonetheless, we are for peace. Nothing untoward will happen again. God forbid. From Kumasi for Joy News, Ohim Interior reporting. Now, Ghana reported 37% voluntary blood donations in 2018, whilst countries within the West Africa sub-region recorded 100%. This was disclosed uh, by the Chief Executive Officer of the National Blood Service, Dr. Justina Ansa, at a blood donation exercise organized by the BMW Club in Accra. In 2018, only 37% of the, our donations were from voluntary donations. We collected under 170,000 units of blood when we need about 280,000 units. You know, so because of that, we always have some shortage of a sort. And with a system we are running where most of our donations are coming from family and friends, you cannot meet your needs for emergencies. So my... What I want Ghanaians to do is that let's see blood donation as a civic responsibility. People should come out and donate on their birthdays, on milestones, you know, that they have. They come and donate. So when we do that, there'll be enough blood. But all I want to tell Ghanaians is that people, sh everybody should donate blood. I mean, well, if it's not everyone. Any, any Ghanaian between the age of 17 and 60 in good health will be, should be able to donate blood, whether male or female. Because as a country, we have never been self-sufficient. Well, Mami K. Stevens, a brand ambassador of uh, the National Blood Service, touched on how superstition is preventing people from donating blood. Um, a lot of times you realize that there's so, so many negative connotations surrounding blood. You know, people are scared about giving blood or um, are not too sure whether to give or not. But this is supposed to create a very um, safe, exciting, fun environment so we can start the conversation about why we need blood to save lives.